welcome to this um, two-part, it is a two-part series, right, on building self-awareness, understanding yourself as a leader, communicator, and team member. I am happy to have Susan Rucker with LeadSpark here as our facilitator today. She's a wealth of information. She's done all of our mid-manager series, so um, what we're going to do instead of using the chat feature, because there's so few of you, um, if ever you want to have a comment or a question, just unmute yourselves and then um, uh, ask Susan a question or make the comment. I think if you're on the phone, you'll have to do star six and then to mute yourself back up. I think it's pound six. But anyway, so I'm going to let, turn it over to Susan then. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I am delighted to be here today. I know some of you, but others I don't. And so I'm really glad you're here. I hope we can make this, since it's a smaller group, a little bit interactive. So feel free to ask questions. It's not gonna bother me at all as we go through this. Um, let me talk just a minute about why this is titled the way it is, as opposed to be uh, entitled ProScan, which is basically the instrument that we're gonna use as a basis for our two webinars. For those of you that are familiar with the concept of emotional intelligence, the first building block of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. And what I will tell you is that I've been in the workplace for a long, long, long time. I learned how to work with ProScan within the last 10 years, and it actually taught me some things about myself that I wish I had known many years ago. And part of it is that you are wired in a particular way. And there's no good or bad way that you're wired. Um, it just is what it is. But it's also true that we can learn skills that help us deal with situations that we will be better equipped to deal with with a skill if we know we need it that we don't necessarily have the natural strength to deal with. And so as we go through this, what I'm hoping is that you will see yourself in this, but I will also tell you that if you don't see yourself, that's okay, and we can talk about that. We did not come over and draw blood and get your DNA, right? We didn't. What we did was we are working on the basis of how you answered a questionnaire and how you are interacting with the instrument. And so we'll talk more about that, but we will also talk a little bit about what words mean, what lessons you can take away from it. And I hope that by the time we get through the end of this in a couple of weeks, it will have been very beneficial to you. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have uh, done a lot of different things. Started off my career at KPMG as an auditor, went to school at William & Mary, made audit partner at uh, KPMG by building a healthcare practice. I was too young and too stupid when they came to me as a new manager and said, you know, we don't have a healthcare practice. Maybe that's something you can build. And I was like, okay and went out and built a healthcare practice. And healthcare is actually my first love in terms of industries or places to work. And for those of you from Westminster Canterbury, Westminster Canterbury was one of my very first healthcare clients. I used to actually be the audit partner for Westminster Canterbury and worked there for quite a few years. Um, in addition to working at KPMG, I've worked for a public technology company, Unisys. I worked for a venture-backed firm for professional services named Tatum. And I am currently the CFO at the William & Mary Business School Foundation on an outsourced basis in addition to doing consulting. While healthcare is my favorite industry, consulting is the love of what I do. And um, I, I love meeting people and helping them solve problems. And so hopefully today you'll get a little bit of benefit from some of those experiences that I've had in the past. We will be on today for about 75 minutes. We will come back together in two weeks to talk about communication and leadership styles. And while we will begin to address that a little bit, hopefully by then you will have had a chance to really understand what's going on with the ProScan. And in two weeks, we actually will be looking at how you apply it 
you know, it's good to have information, but how you apply it is even better. And so that's going to be something that we will focus on in two weeks in terms of how to think about um, how to think about this. So let's dive in and look at better leadership through self-awareness and ProScan. Where does ProScan come from? ProScan actually comes from a company called PDP. They've been around for quite a while. It is a research-based tool. Uh, ProScan is focused on those who are in the workplace. It is not suitable for people who are under the age of 16 because most of them haven't been in the workplace long enough or formed enough values around themselves and other things to really be able to answer these questions in the way that they need to. It's been given at this point to over 7 million people. And so it, it's very well documented. They uh, recently went through an upgrade in terms of terminology and revalidating some of the actual information that is in the ProScan. The ProScan actually, as we've already talked about, helps you understand who you are. It affects your relationships, it affects how you perform. And the other thing that's really interesting about this particular survey tool is that it calls out who you are in a very unique way. There are other instruments that are out there that have very limited numbers of combinations. There's over 146,000 combinations of how all the elements of the ProScan can come together. And what you need to understand is that we're really a unique blend of all the things about us. However, as I'll tell you in a few minutes, you've got one thing that drives you in particular, about 70% of who you are is driven by your highest trait, which we'll cover here in a minute. Today, what we'll cover is your natural strengths, how leveraging those can help you in terms of improving performance. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about leadership and communication styles, but they'll be covered more so next week and then, or in two weeks, and then also how you can interact with your colleagues and others in a couple weeks. The PDP tools are actually focused on looking um, in the initial measurement as an individual, but you can actually use the PDP tools to create job profiles. You can look at fit for a job, and you can combine all of the information um, for teams, and you can actually get a very reliable predictor of how teams will work together based on combining all of the team information. Usually what happens when I work with a team is I'll say, this is where you're gonna have problems, and they say, oh no, that's, that's, we're never gonna have that problem. And sure enough, within a few months, they call back and they say, well, you know, you know when you predicted that, yeah, it's actually, it's actually happened, and now what do we do about that? So you can actually, once you get your information into the system, use it and combine it to look at all different um, ways that you interact with other people. You also can compare it to your boss or somebody who, they, who you work with in what we call a side-by-side -side report, and the side-by-side -side report will actually give you coaching on how the two of you can work best together. What I tend to use it for in my practice is primarily to look at self-awareness and individuals, although I've worked a lot with the other uses as well. And today that's what we're really gonna focus on is how this impacts you. There are core metrics in the PDP universe. You will, if you go ahead and open up your ProScan and turn to page two, you'll see a graphic there, or, or three graphics, that are reflected on this slide, or will be reflected on this slide in a second. On the left, the blue graphic is a summation of who you are as what we call your basic natural self. Your basic natural self actually is 
what we also call your Garden of Eden self. Now, I can't see everybody. Some of you are only available by voice. But if anybody has no stress in their life, please raise your hand really high and wave it. Or please tell me that you have no stress in your life. I see people smiling, but there's nobody here who's willing to say there's no stress in their life. And guess what? That graphic on the right-hand side is basically how you are currently being seen by the world based on how you're adapting to stresses. There are a few people who will be pretty much the same in their blue and their green. But the reality is that most of us, as we look at the stresses we're experiencing, have movement in our characteristics. And this red graphic in the middle is a measurement of the stress that you're feeling and how much it's changing your behavior. So I can actually work with Rich, for example, and Karen can work with Rich. And one day Karen and I sit down and talk and I say, Karen, you know, Rich and I have just been getting along so well and here's how he behaves and blah, 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 blah. And Karen looks at me and she says, what? That's not how he behaves at all. He behaves like so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so -and, -so -and, -so. and the reality is if she and I are dealing with him, one in a non-stress situation and one in a high-stress situation, we might see somebody entirely differently. Another way to think about that is occasionally you might hear someone say to you, you know, everybody talks about me as though I'm like this, whatever this is. And I'm not like that at all. And you know what? That actually might be a true statement, but it might not be how you are presenting to the rest of the world. And so what we'll see as we go through this is that we're complicated beings. We're wired in a particular way, but we've learned skills and how to cope. And depending on the stresses we're currently experiencing, we will be showing something different to the rest of the world. The reality is that your green self, your, your predictor self, actually usually changes every 12 to 16 weeks because your circumstances change. And this is not just your circumstances at work, it's your circumstances at home. And you don't have to tell anybody about this, it's not just at home, it's money, it's faith, it's friends, it's environmental. But if you find yourself under stress, you need to figure out what to do with it. And that's one of the self-awareness pieces that you may walk away with at the end of today. Let's talk about the core metrics. The core metrics are made up of four what we call cornerstone traits. Dominance, extroversion, pace, and conformity. The second thing that's measured is how you make decisions. Just like there is no good or bad trait profile, there's no good or bad way to make decisions, but it's how you interact with fact, feeling, or balancing that that will tell us and tell yourself when you're comfortable pulling the trigger on decisions. The next two are probably the hardest to understand, and I'll explain these more later because it's too much to get into, but your energy style and your energy level. And then last but not least, we'll look at your stress measurements. Now, we've already talked about the basic natural self. If you can behave in the way that you are wired and be in an environment that is um, conducive to that, it is likely going to be where you are the most comfortable and most efficient operating. However, your adaptability is in part based on how intense your traits are. Now, I want everybody to go to page three in their profile. And you might want to have page two and page three out in front of you, 
the whole time we're going through this because we're going to constantly be going back and forth between two, three, and the rest of the report. So if you've printed it out and have it stapled together, guess what? Just rip it apart and put two and three in front of you, and then we'll look at the other pages as well. You see the line kind of, kind of there in the middle, and it says flexible, adaptable. That's what we call the midline. Now, in a minute, what you're going to see, and if you're looking at your page three, you'll see some circles with some letters in them. Those circles are indicating how far away from the midline you are. The further away from the midline your circles are, the more pronounced your trait is. So I want you to think about it this way. If you were to have a circle and the circle was laid out on, a, on the ground near you, think about driving a stake right through the middle of that circle. And then you get a rubber band and you attach one end of the rubber band to the stake and one end of the rubber band to your ankle. The further away from the midline your stake is, your circle is, the harder it is for you to behave differently than what that particular trait is. The closer you are to the midline, the more flexible you are, and you will be more adaptable as you are put into different situations. Everyone has at least one trait that is above the midline and one trait that is below. But it can be a 1-3, a 3-1, or a 2-2. Two, two. Your highest trait, the trait, the circle that is the furthest above the midline, will drive 70% of your behavior and will be the dominant force in how you're wired. Seventy-four percent of the population has all of their circles in these three bars. Each one of these is a standard deviation. There's nothing wrong if it's higher, and this is on the four traits. There's nothing wrong if it's higher or lower. It just means it's more extreme in terms of your preference than with 74% of the population. Here's the other thing. The narrower your profile, the less predictable you are in terms of how you're going to react. Think about it for a minute. When you know people that you can't predict how they're going to react, it's probably because they're what we call a midline profile. Midline profiles have all of their circles between these first two bars. And they'll be whatever they need to be in whatever circumstance. Midline profiles are very, very confusing people. They're also very valuable people because they're extremely flexible. The further apart your circles are, the more predictable you are. And people that are around you will know that. Any questions on that before we move on? OK. So let's dive in. We'll start talking now about the traits. Uh, guess what? I am going to exaggerate discussion about these traits. So if one of these traits describes you and you think I'm not being fair to that trait, that's okay, but I'm being exaggerated so that you will know a little bit about what that trait means. So let's dive in and talk about dominance. High dominance. Dominance is what we call the take charge trait. When you are a high dominant, 
you walk into the room and you assume that you're in charge. You are somebody who acts on the environment and you control it through things. People who are high dominance are the ones who worry about where their office is positioned, where the parking space is, how much money am I going to get in my raise. They are very direct and decisive. They are take charge people who want to win. They have short attention spans. If you're talking to high dominant people, you have somewhere between 30 and 120 seconds. And if you don't have their attention by then, they're off and gone. In contrast, people who are low dominance tend to be more mild mannered. They're composed, they're accommodating supportive, they are non-confrontational, and they may withdraw from conflict. Now, I have now done pro scans on well over 200 people, actually approaching 250 people in the senior living industry. Somewhere between 80 and 90% of you are low dominance. So does that mean you're not leaders? Not at all. It means you've learned to be leaders and it means that you have decided that when you walk in the room, you're gonna be the leader. Interestingly, I'm old enough and have developed enough preferences that I'll walk into a room, I'll look around, and I make an immediate decision as to whether or not I'm going to take charge. And frankly, if you were to tell many people that know me I'm low dominance, they would say there's no way. But it's a learned skill as opposed to people who are high dominance and they assume that they're in charge. The next trait is high extroversion. These are the people who care a great deal about other people. They also act on the environment. What do I mean when I say act on the environment? They will try to change it if they don't like it. So high dominance and high extroversion, if they come into a place and they don't like it, they're going to try to change it. That's a really important point because the next two traits are acted on by the environment and they feel they have to adapt. Now, high extroversion people try to control the environment through relationships and other people. Some of you, I took a peek at some of your pro scans, some of you are high extroversion. You're the people who walk in and you know everybody, or at least you know somebody in every department. When there's a problem, what you do is you try to figure out who you can call to get it fixed, right? You know where to pull the strings because of your relationships. And you are very articulate, you're interactive, you're good at inspiration, but you love to have airtime. Think about how loud it is at a cocktail party when there's a group of high extroversion people. They all love relationships. If they see somebody they don't know, they try to go find them and meet them and they talk. In contrast, people who are low extroversion tend to be more quiet. 
they're the people who are probably having a better time working at home in this COVID crisis because frankly, it's okay with them that they're alone periodically. People who are really high in extroversion, that drives them nuts. They like to be in a job where they can be with people. Low extroversion people value privacy. They can be very good communicators because they think before they talk. But there are also people that are very skeptical if they get pushed. I happen to be low in extroversion. I hate going car shopping. Why? Car salespeople are going to tell you what they think you want to hear. Drives me insane. My husband loves to go car shopping. Whenever it's time to trade my car, he views it as the opportunity to drag me to all the car lots and make me go drive another car and listen to what people have to say. He's learned over the years that that doesn't work very well. But you have to realize that as you look at high dominance, low dominance, high extroversion, low extroversion, what you're beginning to see is above and below the line, you have very different behaviors. And as you begin to think about it, you can see that as you mix these types or mix these styles, it creates both strength in terms of a group and diversity in terms of a group that can also cause problems. The next trait is what we call high pace or patience trait. Now, what I would tell you is if I were naming this, I would probably call this the adaptable trait. People who are high in pace are people who work to deadline. You tell them when you need something and they will fix it and have it ready for you. They can go fast or go slow depending upon what's going on. They are those steady, eddy, dependable, great people that are going to get things done. And they will adjust and adjust and adjust until they won't. If you push these people too far, they will leave. And for those of you that are leaders in this industry, 80% of the people that I have profiled are high pace in this industry. In contrast, people who are below the line in pace are the people who provide urgency in the workplace. They're the ones who, who they really want to get it done and they love change and they're action oriented and they get bored easily. We have very little urgency in this industry which is one of the reasons that the nonprofit groups act differently than the for-profit groups. In part, it's because of the profile of the people who are in the industry. This industry has people who are very change resistant, both because they're high pace and because they are what we call high conformity. High conformity are the people who care about doing things right. They care about the rules. Again, the majority of people in this industry are high conformity. They control through rules. These are the people that you want to be in charge of your accreditation review. These are the people who are going to write your personnel manual. These are the people, again, who are going to get things done. And if you get them to get it done, it's going to be right. In contrast, 
if you are below the line, you're a big risk taker. Have you ever worked with anybody who would look at you and say, yeah, that's a rule, but rules were made to be broken? I've worked with those people. It's really hard. I actually worked for a CEO who was like that. And he, he wanted to do things in regulated industries however he wanted to, and it was very difficult to deal with that situation. These are the people who are very creative in the way they think. If you got to get from point A to point B, these people will think about point A and then they'll think about point B and they can see the picture of what point B looks like, but they can't tell you how to get there. They don't know how to do the steps. The people who are above the line and pay some conformity actually will listen from point A to point B and they can actually write the project plan in their head and they can tell you what's going to go wrong with it. So again, I hope you're beginning to see that as you look at this, you can see that people interact with situations differently based on how they're wired. Now I'm gonna stop for a minute because what I want you to do is I want you to go to pages four and five and I want you to read your description of yourself again, having heard these words. And then I want you to ask me questions either about interpretation of the traits or questions about what it says about you in the profile. Okay. Are there any questions? No? Let me tell you a couple of stories about how these interact. I was teaching one of the mid-manager classes and I've already told you a little bit about myself. I'm below the line in the first two traits, above the line in the second two which means I'm one of those people that has a really hard time adapt, making the environment adapt. And I was in a class where we only had one person who had dominance above the midline. She also happened to have extroversion above the midline. This was a beautiful room that we were using. It was a, um, it was a, a big auditorium. It was a flat, flat floor. We had people at tables. In the front of the room, there was a stage that was elevated a couple of steps up, beautiful hardwood stage. It had a, a screen that would drop down and we had rear projection set up on the screen. So we had all of the um, slides showing up there. I think we had six tables. It was pretty big, pretty big class. And if we were in the room together, you would see that I walk around. It really drives me crazy to do this here. I'm using my hands a little bit, but I, but I love walking around and when I'm teaching. So in addition to the screen, there was a podium up front. And the podium was on the left-hand side of the screen. And, it, and the podium had been pulled out and it was, in front of the screen 
And as I paced back and forth and around the room, what was happening was as I, as I would get to facing the screen, the left-hand side of the room, the podium was blocking my view of the screen because it was up on, it's up on steps. And so the podium literally was blocked. And so every time I get over to this side, if I had to look back at the slide, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm leaning over and trying to see around the podium. And so this goes on for about 10 minutes and I'm walking around and I'm getting irritated because this, this podium is sitting there and it's driving me nuts. And finally, this young lady who's sitting in the back of the room, she stands up in the middle of me talking and she puts her hands on her hips and she says, oh, for goodness sake. And she marches up to the front of the room and what does she do? She moves the podium. Now, why didn't I think of that? It never dawned on me to walk up there and move the podium. She was the only person in the room who was high in dominance. So do you begin to see how this works. And as you begin to know more about the ProScan, you actually can begin to see what happens in terms of how people behave and predict what profile they are. Now, I already talked for a few minutes about midlines. You can see that their profiles are very, very narrow. Midlines are 5% of the population, not many of them. But I want to talk about midlines in a little bit different way because I want to give you a story that also illustrates another point. Many times, most times, we are attracted to being with other people who are like us. And we will tend to hire ourselves. So I've just said these are 5% of the population. One of my early clients in this regard was a company that had a large engineering staff. And I, I worked with that group. I have been working, still am working with that group. I've been working with them for almost six years now. And the first person that I went down there to work with was the head engineer who happened to be a woman who had a very flat midline profile. She loved ProScan. And so we, she had 50 engineers working for her. And so we did her whole group. Over 70% of the group was midline profiles. She had hired herself. All right, so think about that. She had hired herself. When you begin to think about these profiles and how they act or interact, what you have to understand is there, while not everybody in a job will have the same profile, there's some jobs that are better suited to certain profiles. So think, for example, about people who work in call centers doing telesales. How would somebody who's very low in extroversion and very low in dominance do in that circumstance? Not very well. It would wear them out. They're getting rejected. They don't want to walk over people in terms of conversation. They don't like it. Somebody who's high dominant, high extroversion, that's what your sales staff is going to look like. Your nurses are going to tend to be high extroversion. Again, it's not always true, but what you can again begin to see is that you want to think about as you're hiring or as you're bringing people in to complement the team, how is this going to work? Now, PDP actually takes the position, which I like a lot, that you don't have a profile for a job but you can have a profile you desire for a job, but a lot of times it's more important to look at the profile and how it fits with the team than how it's gonna fit with the job. 
because you can have conflict on the team based on profile. So let me give you an example of that. We've, we've talked about this a little bit. I've already told you that most of this industry is low dominant. I don't know if I've told you all four of these things, but they're low dominant, low extroversion, high pace, high conformity. Now, let's bring somebody into that mix who's high dominance, high extroversion. And let's say they're having a conversation. The person who's high dominance, high extroversion, what do they want? They want that person to engage with them. They want them to talk. And what's more, they want to have this discussions. They want to know what these people are thinking, and they're, they're very comfortable with disagreements and conflict. These people don't like conflict. They want time to think about what they're hearing. And so this person comes over, and they have a conversation with this person, and this person says to themselves, I'm going to go away and think about this. And so they leave without engaging. And this person then says, oh my gosh, they're leaving and, and they didn't talk to me. And they run after them. And they say the same thing again. And they're like, talk to me, talk to me, tell, tell me what's going on. And this person says, who is this crazy nut? I want to go back and think about this. And this person follows them again. Now what's happening? This person thinks they're having a conversation and that they're doing that person a favor by trying to engage them. This person thinks they're having a fight. And so you begin to see how this can interact as you go forward. And as you begin to think about how you react to certain people, this is part of the self-awareness. It may be that part of the reaction you have to other people is because of how they behave based on their profile. Now, if that's the case, there's one other thing that, that you need to know about yourself here in terms of predictability, and that is that we have these things called trait pairs. Now, what trait pairs are, are how two traits interact with each other. If there's a plus, see the plus C over P, it means that your conformity has to be above the midline, and it's higher than your pace. But pace can either be above the midline or below. Indirect teller, direct is above. Or our dominance is above extroversion, doesn't matter whether it's higher or lower. These are the trait pairs that are out there. Most everybody has one or two, somebody will have six or seven. Is there anybody who has a trait pair that would be willing to read us what your trait pair is and what it says? We get some audience participation going here. Should be on page five or six of your profile. Hey, uh, this is Rich. I, I'm, I'm game. Okay. So um, let's see. I am uh, direct and or persuasive, dependable and produ or dependable right. productive. Yeah, pick one and okay. read the description, okay? Uh -huh. So I'll do the first one, direct and or persuasive. You have flexibility to either directly tell or pervasively sell when managing people and in the daily interactions. It will be helpful to be consistent with one way or the other. Dominance and extroversion equal. And you and I have that same trait. And here's how we confuse people. Sometimes we're willing to spend the time to persuade them to do something. Sometimes we're not. We just tell them. <laughs> and if we get into the tell mode and then we go over and we try to persuade somebody, they're going, who are you and what did you do with Susan? 
so you have to think about it. Does anybody have um, either persuasive seller or direct teller? Heather, you want to read yours? For the persuasive seller, it says when in charge of people, you prefer to accomplish things through a seller style, a friendly, empathetic, persuasive way of getting help to accomplish the task, at the task, extroversion over dominance. You care more about the people than you care about being in charge. Oh, duh. <laughs> duh, right. People who are direct tellers are the other way around. So again, what you can see is that it, it, you're, you're all, you are not a single thing. You're a combination of your traits. So this is something now that you understand this a little better, you may want to go back and read and, and look at a little bit more later. All right. So Susan. Any, yes. And this is Christy. Um, so I'm not, as I was looking at that page you just had up where it had the, uh, the twin traits or the... Uh -huh. Okay, so I was looking on mine and trying to find should our um, should our chart match that somehow match one of those or not necessarily? What, what do you have on that that you don't see on here? Actually, what I'm closest to is um, on this first column the hard charging. It says plus D and P and organizational advocate. But, for instance, my D is below the line, but E is above the line. And even though my P is low, my C is above the line. So it's like back and forth. All right. But, but on your page, it should tell you which ones you have. It lists the ones that you have. So look on, I think it's page five. I'm not sure. Okay. Six is page six. On page six. Okay, very good. Okay. It'll tell you which ones you have, Christy. Yes. It says persuasive seller, accurate, okay. conscientious, fast, fluent communications. Okay, very good. Thank those, you. Those are the ones you have. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah. Any other questions? This is a lot of material. All right, move now to page seven. We're gonna look at logic. This is your decision-making style. A fact-based decision maker is somebody who makes decisions when they have enough facts. A feeling-based decision maker makes decisions when their gut feels good. And a balanced decision maker is in the middle and can look at both. The danger is that if you're a fact-based decision maker, there are times when you don't have facts. You still have to make decisions and it's very uncomfortable. If you're a feeling-based decision maker, you will need to make decisions and sometimes you won't go get the facts you need and that can be dangerous. So just recognizing the tendency is a good one for you to look at. The next page in your pro scan gets into your energy measures. Now, this is probably the hardest thing to explain. Your energy style is sort of like your gas pedal. And your energy level is sort of like your gas tank. So your energy style is either thrust, allegiance, or a made-up word, tenacity. Thrust people are people who floor it. They get something to do, they, they, they go. They have a harder time finishing. Allegiance people are the people who are really focused on the mission or goal of the group, and they'll be the ones who get you through to the end. The tenacity people are your energizer bunnies. They have a lot of self-motivation. You don't, you don't have to wind them up. They just keep going. Now, when you look at this um, over right here, this on, on your graphic, see energy style? 
it'll show you what your highest one is and everybody has one energy style. Some of you will actually have all three, but the other two will be um, secondary. It will tell you in the write-up in the ProScan which one, one or ones you have. So again, looking at the next page. Now on the energy level, a lot of people say, well, I get a lot done. I am a seven. There are not that many people that are sevens. Let me tell you how to interpret this. What this is, is how long can you work without taking a break? Okay. And people who are sevens are those people who never, ever, ever take a vacation and they can work 18 or 20 hours a day without taking a break. There are not a lot of them. If you are in the four or five, you've got a lot of energy, you know, you're gonna keep going. If you're down in two and three, you're gonna need to conserve your energy and you figured out how to, how to manage it. Um, I'll try to tell this, story in a short way. I usually tell it a little bit more drawn out in the class, but I was helping someone hire an interim CEO. And an interim CEO, you know, a CEO role is pretty, pretty high energy usually. And we were using the job scan, the, the profile to actually create the trade of who we wanted. And then we were bouncing their pro scan against it. And this person came in who had a two energy level. Now, the, the job scan actually gives you questions to ask in the interview. And so there clearly was not a matchup between where we thought the energy level ought to be and where this person was. And so I said, I'm going to ask these questions. And so the question was, how do you handle it if you have more to do than you have time to get it done in? And the person smiled and reached down into this great big bag they were carrying, and they pulled out one of those old-fashioned alarm clocks with the double bells on top, you know what I'm talking about? And they said, I have figured out how to be so productive. I sit down and I set my clock for 45 minutes and I work really hard for 45 minutes. And then I take a 15 minute break. And then I come back and I set my clock for another 45 minutes. Now, interestingly, this person, many of you probably know, it's somebody who's fairly well known in the nonprofit community. And this person has been both self-employed and hired into positions and has done well at both of them. And so they have figured out how to get it done. But I don't know about you, I can't take 15 minutes out of every hour off. But that's what the person does in order to be able to get through the day. So that's the energy level. Questions on decision-making or energy? All right, operational styles. Now we're gonna spend more time on this next time. So I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. Your profile is very predictive of how you communicate, lead, and what we call your backup style. If you had to pick one or two charts out of these materials, out of the slides, I would tell you this is probably one of the three or four most important ones. And you might, if you have this deck printed out, you might wanna put a star by this. This tells you how people like to communicate. I've talked about it a little bit. People who are high in dominance, short attention spans, speak forcefully, say things once, and they want you to communicate with them the same way. People who are high pace, good communicators, but they want time to listen. They want an agreement on the agenda and they want to go away and think about it before they process. People who are high in extroversion love to listen, to talk. They're not as good at listening. And they want to make sure that when you talk to them, you're, you're making sure that you're going to listen to them because they want to be included on the team. 
So thinking about what your communication style is, this is another one of these really important slides, which is how do you have to develop skills so that you can best communicate with others because it is your job to adapt your style so that you communicate well with others. So both high dominance and high extroversion need to learn how to listen for different reasons. High dominance because they have a short attention span and they don't want to, high extroversion because they like to talk. High-paced people, you need to speak up in meetings. What happens is you think you don't like something, but you haven't really made up your mind, and you leave the meeting, and therefore you leave the meeting, and what does everybody think if you didn't say anything? They, Karen's saying it, they think you agreed. You've got to learn how to speak up, even if all you say is, I'm not sure what I think of this. I want time to go away and think about it. High conformity people, you tend to be the negative Nelly. Hey guys, this isn't gonna work. And let me list out all the reasons it's not gonna work. And you drive high extroversion and high dominance people crazy when you do that. Heather, do you see yourself in these things? Or see other people? I see other people and it's, it, yes, they're, that okay. high conformity yeah. one. Yeah, yep. Really it's so true. Yeah. It's so true. Same thing here with leadership styles. These are the leadership styles of each of the different groups. Now, next time we'll actually do an exercise where you're gonna write out your own uh, communication and leadership styles, and your styles are actually blends of, of all of these. But again, realize that some people react to you in different ways based on how you lead them or how you talk to them. Now, here's something that hopefully you don't see very often, but these are what we call the backup styles. This is how people behave when they're under stress. Here's what I would tell you. Hopefully you are adult enough and in a responsible enough position that you have learned not to use these backup styles. But it doesn't mean that you don't feel like using these backup styles. If you begin to get into a situation where you feel like you're going to use this backup style, it's telling you you're under stress. If you have someone who has behaved in one of these ways, it's telling you that they're under stress. It will show up in the priority environment, but what you don't want is you don't want to have these ways of behaving in the workplace or in your own portfolio. Now, again, we'll talk more. We are um, getting tight on time, so I'm going to move us on because I do want to cover this. Now we're moving into the priority environment, and I want you to, to turn through your ProScan until you get to the part where you see this red chart and it, and it talks about stresses. What you'll see on here is there are six major environmental stressors, work, social, family, econ economics, health, and beliefs, or a lot, a lot of people think about that as state. Um, what happens when you look at yours is you see that little blue dot there. The blue dot, if you go back to page two, on page two, you'll see the blue on the left, the red in the center, and the green on the right. The blue dot in the red graphic 
more or less corresponds to the blue dot on the left. The larger red circle corresponds to the green dot on the right. What you need to understand is that the longer the difference between the blue dot and the, and the red dot, the red circle, the more your behavior is adjusting. And if the blue dot's on one side of the midline and the red dot is on the other side, what it means is you're behaving in a way that is contrary to your natural comfort zone. And it's taking a lot of energy for you to do that. The next few pages are actually a little workbook for you to go back and it will tell you if it's counter to the way you like to behave and it'll have a little place for you to check off as to what's causing the stress, work or non-work. You don't have to show that to anybody. You don't have to share it with me. You don't have to share it with anybody. But what I want you to realize is if it's showing that you've got stress, you need to figure out what's causing the stress and whether or not there's anything that you can do with it. Illnesses will show up in this. So it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. And this chart here, which again, we're not going to go over this in detail, but it tells you how your behavior is changing based on where your dots are. So for example, if you are um, high pace and, and your arrow is pointing down, it means you're having to act with more urgency than you're comfortable with and you're having to speed up. That's how to read that chart. Now, one other thing for you to think about, if the dots, if the blue dots are wider than the red circles, top to bottom, what it means is you're feeling boxed in. If it's the other way around, if you're being stretched, you may be being stretched beyond your capacity. Now let's mention one other thing. Stress can be very good for you as long as it's good stress. Just because you're having stress and just because you're behaving differently doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. But you need to kind of think that through and determine you don't want the stress get to get to a point where it's hurting your health. Also on this chart, there's something called a satisfaction measurement. If you have an arrow here pointing up or, or this, this little graphic pointing up, it means you have high or good satisfaction. You may also have it pointing down. For those of us that are perfectionists, if your arrow is pointing down and you're having low satisfaction, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're unhappy. It means you're never happy with yourself. The other thing though that I do want you to pay attention to is this energy drain. Now the energy drain is the difference between this K, which is your, your normal energy level, and this is where are you at the end of the day. It is normal to have an energy drain of about what we call two sigmas or two standard deviations. I've seen people who have gone from here all the way down to here. That's bad. If you're having that much energy drain, it means something is really wearing you out and you need to figure out what it is and is there some way for you to deal with that. The green that you will now get to in your ProScan is how people are seeing you when you add in the stress changes you're making in your behavior. Homework is for you to go back and reread this and reread the green section and compare it to the blue section 
now that you understand what it is. I want to cover two more things, and then I'm going to save just a couple of minutes for questions. The last two pages of this are what we call the motivators worksheet and the needs survey. Again, homework. I find these very difficult, to be honest. Um, it's really being honest with yourself about what is motivating you. Or, um, did somebody, uh, did somebody unmute, unmute themselves? themselves? I, think, I think what's happening, there we go. Um, also, your needs. Ideally, you'd go through and try to figure out what are your top four motivators and what are your top four needs. Sometimes they're in conflict. Why? Well, think about somebody who just comes out of school. They got debt a lot of times. If they don't have debt, they've been living like a poor student. What do they want? Money. Or they need money. But you got a lot of people where money's not really a motivator. And by the way, the motivators are tailored to your type. What happens if you don't really like working for money, but you need it? You might find yourself moving into a role where you take it for the money and you may or may not be happy. Because what you're really after is praise or change or uh, direction or working for somebody who's a strong leader. So that, my friends, is the pro scan. Next time, we will talk about how the ProScan impacts your communication and leadership styles, and we'll open with just a little bit more about how it impacts team behavior. We've got about uh, three minutes for questions. Does anybody have questions? Comments? This is very enlightening. So thank you, Susan, for this. Thank you oh, for taking well. it. I Thanks. would be interested in taking the rest of my team through it. You can do that. And we also <laughs> can create something called a team scan that will show you how you perceive each other. Oh, which is that's really very fun. good. That's so helpful. So helpful. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to next time. Sounds great. Thanks, Christy. Anybody else? Did you say that the uh, uh, slide deck would come out? Yes, Paul, are you going to send that out? Yeah, I haven't gotten it from you yet. I sent it to you yesterday. All right, it's lost in the in the ether, but I lost. we we'll, we we'll, yes, we will get it out. I'm sorry, I thought we had sent it to you, but yes, you'll get it. And I'll send it out when I send out the. Um, evaluation, the post test, because if you want SHRM or um, NAB, you will have to send that pro, uh, test back to me, hopefully this week. So yeah, I'll send it out then. Okay. Very Susan, good. thank you. Also, I'm sorry for interrupting. I'd also like to say, this was going to my spam. So when she sends those things out, who will that be coming from? Paula Ropoluski, if you okay. have the list of people, you see her name there? Yeah, it'll be coming from yes. Christy. It'll be coming from me. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, the only thing that came from something else was um, the pro scan that came from some, somewhere else, yeah. Very good, thank you. All right. Well, you guys have a great rest of your day. I hope you learned something. Now, you're, you know, if ever you take a class from me, you'll know there's homework. So here's your homework. Reread your ProScan. Think about what's causing your stress and think about how to deal with it and complete your motivator and overriding needs sheets and kind of think about what that means to yourself. For those of you that don't have a personal development plan, the other thing I would say to you is those skills to develop, I want you to think really long and hard about whether or not you need to develop those skills. They're important. And that's that's a good thing for you to think about in terms of your own personal development plan. Paula, thanks to you and to Leading Age for giving me the opportunity to work with these folks. 
I will be in touch with Paula today. Paula, I'm going to resend the deck so you don't have to go searching for it. Okay. And we will see you guys in two weeks. Thank you all.